Good morning, everyone. This is the instinct and experience versus research. What do buyers want? And I know that's why we are all here, is to figure out what these people are buying. Uh, as sellers, it's an important thing. These, these are always uh, useful panels to get the, uh, uh, the insight of the people that are actually buying the programs that we all make. Well, let me introduce everyone to you. I have Barbara Euchre, who's the Head of Programming and Acquisitions at ABC Australia. We have Karen Miller, who's the Director of Acquisitions and Co-Productions, Disney Channel Worldwide. We have Michael Carrington, who is the Senior VP, Chief Content Officer, Turner Broadcasting, and Natalia Ergarova, Head of Acquisitions, Channel One, Russia. And all of these people are not only probably well known to you, but also are able to give us a little bit of insight as to the things that they are, they are looking for. This panel is a little bit different because it's not, I think of it almost as a two-part question. Uh, there's the content part, but also we've been asked to talk about uh, the research side of what buyers look for. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Barbara to give us a little bit of insight on what she looks for and also present herself. No. no. Yes? No. <laughs> okay, again, good morning. It's amazing how many people are here and I saw some friendly faces. That's nice too. Um, I'm working for the ABC in Australia, the public broadcaster. Um, since I'm not sure if you are familiar with our channel or channels, I thought I'd give you an idea um, what our kit's offer looks like and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, me, myself. Um, we've launched ABC3, our channel for school-aged kids, in, uh, on December 4th, 2009. We offer programs from 6 a.m. till 9 p.m. for the older kids. And um, over the years since I'm there, we've extended our hours, our preschool offering on ABC2. Uh, and now we offer preschool content from 6 a.m. to 7 PM. So that's quite a bit. So we have uh, quite some hours to fill. And I could answer the question, what do buyers want with one um, easy answer? A lot. Not only a lot of content, but with this changing um, uh, offerings that are there, we need more rights. So for example, uh, streaming rights for our online offer are very, very important for us. Uh, when we are looking at the older kids, we have a broad variety of different genres. We have not only animation and drama, we offer documentaries, wildlife, factual entertainment, um, current affairs and news. Besides this, Australian content is um, key for us. When we got the funding for ABC3, we agreed to offer 50% of Australian content within three years. and as the moment it looks like we're getting there even a bit earlier. In the preschool area, there is no um, fixed percentage of Australian content, but we are trying to aim for 25% of Australian content for our uh, preschool audience. So what works for us? Um, for the older kids, Total Drama Island is very, very successful. The Star Wars Clone Wars um, series rates very well for us, so we do have a little bit that works for Cartoon Network. And we have a very successful um, home-produced drama series called Dance Academy that is at the moment, the second series is in post-production, and we are looking very much forward to having this on our air soon. For the preschoolers, um, Kids love our um, hosts, our preschool hosts, Jimmy Giggle and Hoot the Owl. We do have um, 
we created a new version of the bananas in pajamas. Not sure if many people are um, familiar with the old bananas in pajamas, so I'm just curious, who knows the bananas in pajamas? Oh, wow, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. So we decided to, to breathe some new life into these uh, costume characters and decided to create an animated version, which was a bit of a gamble because um, the Bananas and Pajamas in Australia, they are really iconic. So every Australia Day Parade, there is an appearance of the Bananas and Pajamas characters. So, but we've um, decided to give it a try and launch it in May and it works. The kids do love the Bananas and Pajamas, which is a great relief. And by the way, I was the executive producer on it, so I'm very, Proud, <laughs> and Cartoon Network again um, is a partner for the Bananas and Pajamas. They came on board at a very early stage. So that's probably a, a quick snapshot of what we are doing and what works for us. Oh, I was wanted to mention Peppa Pig and the Octonauts are um, another sh two shows that work very well for our preschool audience. Um, I had nearly 20 years experience um, working for public, different public broadcasters in Germany before I joined the ABC in 2008 when they've asked me to um, help them to launch ABC3. So I worked in two different sort of cultures in a way, even though I felt that there are quite um, some similarities between the both, both um, countries. Um, Yes, so I think that's it from me for now. Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? Um, I'm Karen Miller, and I work for Disney Channels Worldwide. Um, I am relatively new to the job. I've been there for just shy of one year now, and I truly have to say it's a privilege and an honor every day to go to work at Disney. It's, um, I was a longtime employee at Warner Brothers, and so Disney was across the street. We used to be able to see it, and, and in many cases would point to really what they did so well, and that was that there really was this collaborative effort in every case to not only create content, but support content. And that was something that I think while we strive to do um, there, we just didn't do it as well as Disney. And, and quite frankly, I think no one does it as well as Disney. So um, it's, it's definitely a highlight in my life to now be there um, and to be a part of an amazing creative team. We, um, as you many of you know, in February, we relaunched um, Playhouse Disney as Disney Junior, and it's been incredibly successful. And one of those shows leading the way is Jake and the Neverland Pirates. Um, and we've got so much incredible content that's coming your way very soon, one of which is Doc McStuffins. Um, and she's, we just saw some of it the other day in a meeting, and she's this beautiful girl who um, mends everything from a broken button to a broken heart. Uh, and it's just a delightful story and series. And, and, and the kind of the refocus of Disney Junior for us is that it is, and you'll see the content, and what we look for is very um, story-driven and very character-driven. And that's a kind of a difference from where we were when we were at Playhouse. Um, but it is, it is at the very heart and core of what we do at Disney, it's that magical storytelling. So whether it's, you know, it's for that younger preschool audience or it's for um, our Disney Channel audience or it's even for our Disney XD audience, it really is story driven, it's character driven. Um, they are in different ways on their own journeys, the, the characters that we have in our series. Um, and what we're looking for at the market is, uh, you know, it's really, it seems very cliche, but it really is more great shows. I mean, I think, again, I am so privileged to be at a place where we. Uh, create such great content in-house. Um, and so as an acquisitions uh, director, it's a challenge for me to come to the market and to really find things that sit side by side. And when we look at things, we 
they really do have to sit by side by side from a quality standpoint to a storytelling standpoint. Um, and some of it is as simple as if, if you've ever sent me something and I sent you a note back, sometimes it's as simple as and as vague as it just isn't the right tone or the right texture. You know, you'll see that many of our shows have a certain feel, have a certain look. Um, and I think it also speaks to the strength of the brand and those brands on those channels. So it's, um, it's always great to come and to see so many familiar people in the audience uh, and to see such good content. But it, it, is, it is challenging, I think, for us because there is definitely a, a tone and a texture and a brand that we deliver day in and day out to our kids. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess it's over to me. Uh, I'm Michael from Turner. I've been at Turner Broadcasting for just one year and six months. Before that, I was at the BBC for quite some time. Um, I think it's a privilege that I'm at Turner. Um, we have an amazing creative department in Burbank. Uh, we work very closely with our uh, great colleagues at Warner Brothers Animation. So we're not only uh, one studio, we're two studios. Uh, around 90% of our original production comes from there. Uh, so you can see that there's not much left, really, in terms of original production. Uh, but we are launching The Amazing World of Gumball at lunchtime today, so please join us for lunch and uh, see that amazing show. Um, I guess the, the thing to tell you about us at Turner Broadcasting is that we're essentially a pay TV service, um, both at the domestic market in the US and internationally. Um, we have a portfolio approach, so we uh, start young with our preschool brand Cartoonito, which essentially has been a dedicated preschool channel in the UK, but last month rolled out across Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, it is either a block on our other channel, Boomerang, or it is a dedicated channel in its own right. For example, in Spain, Cartoonito is a, a full-blown preschool channel. Uh, as I mentioned, Boomerang. Boomerang is our um, channel where we have a lot of our Warner Brothers animation, a lot of our Hanna-Barbera catalog, and brand new classics. So things like the remake of uh, The Pink Panther or Garfield sit on Boomerang and do extremely well. Um, so Cartonito, three to six-year-old children, Boomerang um, probably starts at around four and moves up through 10 years of age. And then, of course, Cartoon Network is our primary network, and Cartoon Network is basically everywhere in the world uh, and targets an audience of 6 to 12-year-old boys and girls. Um, we live and breathe animation, but we also uh, have some live-action shows on Cartoon Network uh, where it makes sense. A live action for Cartoon Network is obviously a challenge, um, but uh, when we get it right, it works extremely well for the audience, and the audience kinds of expects live action these days. So, uh, Cartoon Network, uh, a lot of original production from Burbank, as I mentioned. Uh, we're starting to make stuff in Europe, um, but we also look to acquire third-party content. And that content can either be action-adventure. A small part of our portfolio is given over to action-adventure, boy-skewed but girl-inclusive. Uh, so we have things like Bakugan. Um, but these days, um, you know, it's that old cycle where you go from action to comedy, and we are now very much in the comedy cycle. Um, the Amazing World of Gumball is a comedy show, uh, and many of our top-rated programs in the US are dr comedy-driven shows like Adventure Time and Regular Show. Uh, so basically, we're looking for comedy-driven entertainment, very strong characters, uh, the shows that are working for us have a sweetness and a heart about them that, that uh, boys and girls empathize with and recognize. So while they might be surreal uh, and fantasy worlds, there's something about the storytelling and about the makeup of the personalities of the main characters that has a resonance with our audience. Um, and I think that's the key to a successful show for us. So there we have it, Cartoonito, Boomerang, and Cartoon Network. I might also mention that outside our pay TV um, initiative, we also have started to introduce some free-to-air channels. For example, in Italy, we have a, a service called Boeing, which is a partnership with Mediaset. We've also launched Boeing in Spain. 
and uh, various other places are uh, earmarked. So Boeing is more general entertainment, uh, but we do acquire programs for Boeing. Uh, it's boy and girl inclusive and probably targets from around five to 12 years of age. And uh, it's a mixture of live action and animation. So it's a quite a broad entertainment channel for children. That's us. Thank you, Michael. Natalia? Yes, hello guys. I'm Natalia Gorov and I'm uh, representing Channel One Worldwide and I'm very happy uh, to be here today to present the new project of um, Channel One together with Vizhtarki, which is a new Russian um, channel for kids called Carousel. And I think I'd better get up now because my lovely colleagues from the uh, marketing department have prepared um, a lovely presentation for you guys to see what Carousel is. So to start with, um, Carousel is uh, the new leader of the Russian TV for kids, twins and young teens and it was created on the basis of uh, the two major uh, kids broadcasters TV Nanny and Bibigon, uh, represented by Channel One on the one hand and Vigitarki on the other hand. Uh, so now less than in one year uh, after the launch of uh, Carousel, which was actually launched uh, late in late December 2000, uh, 2010, uh, and now in less than a year after the launch of the channel, we already have the researchers of TNS Russia that proved uh, that we have uh, the audience of 43.3% um, of the viewers in Russia only. Um, the channel um, actually has the target audience, uh, which is the children uh, from three years old to 14 years old, but the same researchers of TNS Russia now prove that uh, the viewers include not only children but their parents as well, uh, which actually shows the loyalty of the um, audience to the channel and proves that the channel is also uh, is both uh, kids and family oriented channel. Uh, the target audience that I've mentioned uh, from 3 to 14 years old is now watching uh, Carousel on average for 62.8 minutes daily, which actually again proves the popularity of the channel among the viewers. Oops, sorry. Um, Carousel has a very strong in-house production as well as acquisitions. Uh, we produce about 50% of what we show on air of Carousel. Um, and at the moment, uh, we, have, uh, we are developing more than uh, 40 original uh, entertainment formats and programs. Um, each of them is developed under the guidance of leading uh, child psychologists and educators. Uh, programming on uh, Carousel is very strictly uh, structured um, in accordance with the needs of the different age group that we have uh, on our channel, which means that we start the programming schedule uh, with the baby and preschoolers programs, um, follow up uh, with the programming for the toddlers, and the late uh, time slots are given for the uh, teenagers and preteens. Uh, following the recommendations of specialists, cognitive and educational programs are combined with active sports games on the channel. Um, as mentioned before, uh, Carousel is a very unique uh, project. Um, it's a very unique ch uh, kids' channel uh, for the kids from 3 to 14 years old, which is available not only in Russia, but also worldwide, which means that we are broadcasting outside of Russia as well. Um, in Russia, we are broadcasting both in free TV and pay TV systems, and outside of Russia, you can see us practically in all the uh, pay TV systems as well. Um, In terms of acquisitions, we are very accurate with selecting the programming for the viewers. Um, and exclusivity for us comes in the first place. Um, in the season of 2011-2012, uh, we will launch more than 10 new programs as well as uh, the first chance of uh, very popular features, animated series um, and animated films and live action projects as well. Uh, then high ratings. We also look at the high ratings of the projects that we acquire um, and if they worked outside of Russia or not, uh, for which audience they worked, etc. Uh, then viewers' opinion is very important for us as well. We are very interactive with our audience. We, are, uh, we have several forums and websites uh, where we receive the feedback from the viewers, from the parents, from the children, and 
we actually look at those uh, letters and those messages and we take that into consideration. Uh, then we also have uh, focus groups uh, with every age group. We have a certain <coughs> focus group when creating, when either creating a program or acquiring a program. Uh, we have the focus group with parents, we have the focus groups with teachers, with educators, etc. Um, so as a buyer, I'm interested in practically all range of the kids programming, uh, starting with live action programs, live action series, live action uh, movies, uh, following the animated uh, series, films, etc. So everything that you've got uh, for the children from 3 to 14 years old would be very much interested, interesting to me to have a look at. I'm sorry. Um, and I'll take just a few minutes more of your attention to uh, say that under the umbrella of Channel One Worldwide, we're not only doing uh, Carousel Channel, we also have a range of pay TV channels, uh, thematic pay TV channels. One of them is um, one of them is a biographical. Uh, channel Vrena, uh, the other one is um, a channel of haute cuisine and cooking which is called Telecafe. Um, then we have Russian film channel called Dom Kino and then um, in the end of, uh, of the list we have uh, Muzika Pirova which is um, a Russian music channel. So all the details about the pay TV market um, in Russia you can actually here at the conference that we have on Wednesday, so October the 5th, at 5.30 p.m. Um, under the umbrella of Focus on Russia. So I'll be most happy if you join me there. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things I wanted to throw out to, uh, to our esteemed panel is, is getting right to the theme of instinct and experience versus research. And I think all of the, uh, the sellers and the producers would like to know whether or not, what drives your programming decisions? Is it the research that you, you have done or do you look for creative uh, uh, productions and then test them to see if they will work? Uh, does one lead versus the other? Barbara? Maybe she can borrow. Well, um, we as public broadcasters usually um, have very tight budgets, so there is um, a limitation to the testing we're doing because that usually uh, costs money and we try to put this um, money into content. Mm -hmm. So I'd say we probably rely very much on, on the gut instinct, the experience, and of course we, we listen to our, our viewers. Um, our online office um, gives kids the, the opportunity to discuss um, shows on our me message boards, in chats, and we listen carefully to that. Mm -hmm. So that's um, why I would say from, from our point of view, we're probably relying on the cheaper gut instinct. Mm -hmm. Somehow, somewhere in the back of my mind, I would believe that Disney probably tests things quite a bit. We, we do, we do. I mean, I think, you know, everybody knows it's really truly in our DNA. I mean, it is who we are. We, we have the most amazing research teams. They're in the field every single day. They talk to kids all the time um, about their aspirations, their likes, um, what engages them. And so I think at the very, again, the very core of what we do, we, we know our kids probably, you know, I think it's safe to say as well, if not better than any broadcaster out there. Um, you know, we use research, it's, it's not a prescriptive um, tool for us. I mean, what I mean by that is that it's, it literally is something that, it's one tool. It's not, it's not a pass or fail with us. Um, we use it to help us inform our decisions that we're gonna make. Um, we do, I, th I think that instinct is one of those, for all of us, whether you're a producer or a broadcaster or a buyer, you know, instinct is a part of, of, of all of us. And I think what we do and how we make our decisions 
Um, and so I think it gets us in many cases to where we are and where we, the, ch the shows we choose to make or choose to buy, but we do use research to kind of help inform us as to whether that is a right fit for us. Um, and it literally, I mean, again, it goes hand in hand with all of the creative and the executive teams at Disney. We, we use it to inform us, um, and, and it's, it works. Clearly does. Michael. Yes, Cartoon Network does uh, test programs. We connect with our audiences in many different ways to check in with them. Um, but I think, you know, good instinct comes from experience and experience is based on knowledge. Um, and so without connecting with audiences, um, that knowledge base um, wouldn't be as rich and as expansive uh, without research. So I think that, you know, as Karen said, it's a tool in our portfolio. Um, when we're looking for programs, we know our brands incredibly well. Our channel brands are the first place that we start. Cartoon Network is all about having fun. Um, and so that's where we start, which is a good place. Um, but then we need to check the types of programs that we already have in our portfolio, the types of programs that are in development, and the types of programs that kids are watching. So it, it just is part of the tools that are at our disposal to help us inform um, how to fill our gaps, basically. But I, I think you know the, the one thing about research is that you can trust it or you can discard it, depending on how you feel about the program based on your instinct. So uh, on the one hand, it's a good thing, um, and it's great to hear what children are up to, what their likes and their dislikes are, what technologies they're into, what other brands they're engaging with, but at the same time, they lie through their teeth. So uh, you can't <laughs> believe everything that you hear. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just be repeating my colleagues saying that uh, research is indeed one of the strongest tools, of course, but it's very important to understand what your viewers want because the research would give you a general idea of um, the concept of the channel, of uh, how to be uh, in general. But every time when I'm trying to buy something or going into negotiations, of course, I screen every program myself and I very strongly rely on my own opinion as well because I'm changing uh, with the children that are changing right now. They, they are changing every day because of the new technologies, the new realities of the world. Uh, so of course when you feel what they want, that's the most strong tool for you. So instinct plus research is, uh, is uh, the secret of success of Carousel, I think. Do any of you think that kids are more predictable now? than they used to be. It seems Whenever have children been predictable? <laughs> well, when, if you look at some of the uh, statistics or the empirical data, uh, there's, there are certainly trends. But one of the things that uh, a lot of people have said to me as a program supplier is that because technology has allowed kids to advance so quickly, they are less predictable than they than they used to be. So it's more difficult for programmers or, or broadcasters to try to hit that wave at the right time. It, do, have any of you had that experience? Uh, I think in, in my experience, children haven't changed that much. Um, you know, they are still incredibly curious. They have an insatiable appetite for knowledge and for experience in whatever form they can get it. And I guess so what's changed is the fact that they can get it wherever they want it, um, on mobile devices and on their traditional TVs, etc. So I think at, at the core, children haven't changed that much. It's just that they are, are now exposed to so many different ways of getting the content. And I guess that, you know, that content can shift so they can be, I guess, more fickle than they used to be. Uh, you used to be able to run a television series of 13 episodes once a week um, and have a global hit. Um, these days, you have to make programs work within six weeks. And if they ha aren't working within six weeks, then you know that your audience is unlikely to come back to them if you take it off air. So I guess it's the, um, there's a, short, a shortened period of time where something can be a success or not. And I guess that's what's changed. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with Michael. I think it's, um, it's very much the access to so much content and the variety of content and the places that they find it. I think, you know, again, kids are kids and they have the same likes. They, they like to laugh, they like to have fun, they like to play. You know, they love their families and their friends. So those are the things I think that will never change. Um, but I, I do agree that it really is about the enormous amount of access they have to so much more than, than certainly I did. Um, but I, I think, I, I think they are, they are who they are and, and they're kids. And, and I, I, again, I also think by having uh, our teams in the field all the time, we do have a sense of, of what they want, when they want it, how they want it. It, it works. Yes, there surely are fashions that are some topics pop up and um, not only dinosaurs and trains are some topics that come and go. Uh, but I thought it was quite interesting when we've launched ABC3, we've put a drama series on air that um, I think they've started producing it in 97, 98. And back then it was hugely successful and it worked for the audience um, of today as well as it did um, a long, long time ago. So that was a great, great experience. Um, well, I think that the kids haven't um, changed so much in their likes, uh, but the world around them has changed, obviously. And I think, well, for me as a buyer, I can see that the channel should go offline as well, off air. So it should be present in practically every source where the children can get access to the content that you want them to see um, under the flag of your channel. That is very important to be communicating with them in every possible way. That, that's, the, that's the thing, I think. Do you think, do you think that it is the job or one of the missions of broadcasters to be trendsetters for kids? Or as broadcasters, do you follow the trends? Do the kids tell you? I guess if I had the true answer to that, I'd be a very <laughs> rich man <laughs> on my other yacht <laughs> out in the harbor. Um, but I, I, I guess seriously, you know, for us to be distinctive in the marketplace, and you have to remember that in many countries around the world, we're talking about 20 more channels dedicated to children and so for us to be distinctive in the marketplace we kind of have to push the boundaries and we have to look for you know our own trends um, which push kids to think about story in a different way um, at Cartoon Network we are particularly known for our visual difference um, we have many different styles of animation um, and that's what helps us stand out in the market uh, so I, I think that we do, uh, where we can, have to, to push the trends forward and hopefully, uh, you know, children will come to uh, that effort that we're making. For example, The Amazing World of Gumball, uh, I think, is a trendsetter in its uh, unique visual style, um, marrying photorealistic images with 2D animation and 3D CGI characters. Um, uh, so that, that's new and distinctive. We hope that that will set a trend. Uh, but at the end of the day, you also have to understand the audience, and that's where we get back to research, connecting with them, talking to them, talking to them and their parents, um, to understand what they're up to. And in many ways, you need to be relevant, so you have to do the stuff that they're doing. Um, well, actually, the trend for Carousel, for example, is combining um, classical things, classical, um, some classical features, films, etc., that are known, that are actually very well known, not only to the children but also to the to their parents uh, with something very new that we can present to them um, and we can we can actually show them how it's all being developed from from the classical things to the nowadays uh, new content which is um, only accessible for the contemporary children we I, I think we we don't we, we program to sh we program shows that I think are relevant to kids. And 
I don't think that we follow trends. I don't think that we, I mean, could, do we set trends? I think that the kind of shows and the stories we tell with the characters we tell definitely influence kids uh, and, and in a very positive way. But I, we, don't, we don't follow the trends. I mean, we, we make programs that are relevant that kids relate to. And that's why it works. And that's driven a lot by the testing that you do and... Yeah, again, I think it points to the fact that we, we know our kids, we know our brands, we know, we know what they want, and we deliver on that promise. I mean, that is very much in our mission statement across all three channels. Mm -hmm. yeah, again, kids don't change that much. No. They go through their faces. Well, it, looking across our, our panel here, we have two broadcasters that operate basically worldwide and two broadcasters that are basically within one country. Uh, do you think that it's easier to find programming for one country versus, it is, versus Michael and, and Karen, what you're looking for, which is kind of global brands? That was actually the question I wanted to ask Michael. <laughs> Does your research group um, groups differ very much in their um, results if you test a program across different countries in Europe even, not only around the world? There are some anomalies, um, usually uh, trended to cultural references, but essentially, as I said earlier, children are very, very similar. They might be richer, or they might be poorer, but essentially they're the same. They want to laugh and they're curious. Uh, so we don't see uh, too much difference across the world. Um, generally, they like the same concepts. Um, and th that's our experience so far. But in terms of being a global broadcaster, um, it, is, it is a fine balance. Um, we have a philosophy of around 80% of the content that we bring outside of our original production is shared, um, not necessarily across every region in the world, but certainly within the territory that I'm primarily responsible for, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, we try to acquire rights for programs like Bananas in Pajamas, for example, as we launch Cartoonito, where that show is available in all of our territories. So, um, and, and that makes not only sense for the audience when we're building one brand and connecting with audiences in a particular way, but also in terms of value for money, to buy a program in an individual country around the world and to put it together is a very expensive process. So while we're still paying market rates by do leveraging um, the number of territories we're in, the countries that have less money to spend on programming gain value by uh, being able to leverage the value that countries that are bigger can, can bring to the um, negotiation. So I, I guess um, when, you're, when you have a philosophy of 80% of the content coming from, uh, from a global perspective, um, it narrows the uh, amount of content that is available that works in every territory. But in animation, we're incredibly lucky because you can dub animation in multiple languages um, and you don't have the same issue that you might do in live action. Live action tends to be much more parochial and specific to a particular country or region, although obviously American content seems to travel um, more readily than, say, Italian or British content. Um, but animation tends to uh, travel incredibly well to many, many countries because of the ease of dubbing. We, um, we have a very similar philosophy in the sense that we try to acquire shows worldwide. I mean, it, it benefits all of us. We have an amazing acquisitions team worldwide and that we, we are constantly talking to each other. We work really well together in looking at how we can take a, a program that we have a similar response to and bring it to all of us. I mean, it, it, sometimes it works, sometimes the, difference, it, it, the differences are, most times they're culturally different, uh, or it could be that what we need is not the same need in another territory by versus, by, by versus of, of the fact that they have, you know, they're full up on action adventure, or uh, we need 
live action or they need less live action, whatever the case may be. But we, we do try to share all of our shows worldwide. And, you know, again, sometimes it works, most times it works, but often there just are differences. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the success of ABC3 probably relies to a, a big part of that we actually cater for the Australian um, kids and we can create shows that reflect their daily lives. I mean, not saying that um, your show's not working well as well, but um, that is the point of difference for ABC3, that we do have um, this strong Australiana to our content. Um. Well, actually, um, I, I totally agree with Michael, who says that children around the world are pretty much the same. And um, I just want to say that a great tool for us um, in terms of the viewers who live outside of Russia are their parents, because they are more interactive with us than the parents in Russia. Uh, and they are telling us uh, what they want for their children, uh, given the fact that we are practically the only one or... or rather the major Russian-speaking um, Russian uh, kids channel outside of Russia. So they tell us usually what they want and we are obviously also having some uh, results of different researchers in different countries, but the parents help us a lot. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I know Russia is, is a, a vast country. Are there regional, do you program True. regionally there? True, True. yeah. Um, so again, we are already dealing with a very huge territory and um, so going outside of Russia is not a problem for us. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to put each one of you on the spot and if, if there, is there a program that is on another channel that you wish was on yours? I think we get that question every time, don't we? And, and my answer is always the same. No, I mean, I, I, are there things that I, are there things that I like? Absolutely. But I think what's true to our, to Disney is that the shows that are on our networks are, they work for a reason and they fit our audience. And so while, you know, every one of us has great shows, I think they don't necessarily travel to other networks or other broadcasters. I think in some cases they do, but I, I really feel that, you know, there, I, I don't really have any show envy. <laughs> I have show envy. Do I do. do you? What yes, <laughs> I do have show envy for Ben 10. I wouldn't mind having Ben 10. And I wouldn't have mind having Hannah Montana, so. Well. <laughs> Well, I think I've acquired everything that we needed already. <laughs> You've acquired all of your envy. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. Yeah. Michael? Envy True confession. I was going to avoid that one. <laughs> uh, I, I just love children's programming in general. That's why I'm in this industry. So I love everybody's content. And I'm very pleased that they have it on their own air. Very political. I like that. <laughs> Actually, I have a specific question for, me, for you, Michael. Was it difficult making the transition from a public broadcaster to a commercial one? Uh, not at all. Um, I loved what I did at the BBC, and it was an extraordinary place, and a place where you could take extraordinary risks. Uh, I guess, um, you know, one aspect of public versus commercial is that the risks that you can take commercially uh, have more impact for the corporation that you work for. Um, so I guess that's, that, that's been uh, something of a, a, an interesting learning curve for me. But otherwise, you know, the BBC was an extraordinary place that, that made extraordinary programs and still does. Um, and Turner Broadcasting is also an amazing place, I guess driven by an entrepreneurial spirit, you know, um, created by Ted Turner all those years ago with CNN and then buying the Hanna-Barbera catalog. And that enthusiasm and entrepreneurial spirit still exists today within Turner Broadcasting and also within Warner Brothers Animation, who also have an incredible heritage of um, providing programs that engage with young audiences and uh, old audiences the like. So um, I, it's been an extraordinary journey and one that I'm loving and relishing. Very good. Karen. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. 
What are the trends that you see coming up? You know, in the screening today, I made a note. There are a lot of dogs and a lot of dragons. I, I don't know why. Um, at least in the screenings there were today. Um, live action is something that we do so really well. I think that what we're starting to see, and you will see on October 17th, if I can do a, do a promo for us, October 17th, Disney XD, Fort Boyard, The Ultimate Challenge. Uh, so I, for us, hopefully there'll be a trend to see more reality competition shows for kids, game shows, I would say, are things that we are looking at. And, you know, comedy, comedy is always king. And I think that that's, that's again, as Michael said early on, I mean, we, we saw that wave of action adventure, and we're seeing that wave now of comedy-driven adventure, and that's something that also uh, excites us. Mm -hmm. Barbara? Well, it's probably a bit um, supernatural. A couple of angels shows are coming up, and a few shows where kids save the world. As they do every day. I think the new heroes are appearing and that's the, the main trend uh, that we see on Carousel. Mm -hmm. But because children want the new heroes and like Barbara said, I totally agree, uh, something supernatural as well, very interesting for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess we're seeing um, new family audiences in many countries in prime time on Saturday evening, and that's driving trends for children. So some of the non-scripted programs like Hole in the Wall, those big budget, big family, exciting shows um, that have done quite well around the world, uh, we're seeing that translated into to some kind of kids format. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have our own Ben 10 Ultimate Challenge game show, which we've just produced for 14 countries, which uh, we're launching this month. Um, and so out of the non-scripted live action stuff for us, um, comedy live action uh, is key for us. And it's not sitcom. Uh, we're not trying to replicate the Disneys and Nicks of this world. We're looking for our own way in live action. Uh, and it tends to be uh, more reality-based comedy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I would point to Malcolm in the Middle as, you know, that, that's something that I think is the most extraordinary thing um, so we would look for that and also comedy animation. And I mean, you know, we're actually, we're shying away from comedy action shows. We're actually wanting just pure comedy. So quite surreal fantasy comedy that has a resonance with our audiences. And I'm seeing slowly and slowly that those, those types of shows are coming through. If there was one bit of advice that you would have for people that are anxious to sell you programs, what would it be, Barbara? Oh, um, look at our programs and see what we're having on air. And I'm sometimes surprised what kind of shows I get pitched. Mm -hmm. I'd probably have pitched some to you. Yeah, I would mirror what Barbara said. I think it really, I mean, know your audience. And I think that's a really great key. I think it's, it's for us as well is, is know who you're pitching to, know your broadcaster, um, know the kind of shows they have, know the audience that they have, that they feed, and, um, you know, and persevere, truly. I, I think that's how things get done in this world is, um, and certainly as a producer, you have to be passionate about what you do, and, and your passion, when you pitch to us, your passion comes through and it gets us excited about something. So, uh, you know, in many cases, don't give up. I think some of the most successful shows that have worked in the world, whether they're just a country-by-country country success or whether they're actually a global success, are driven by enthusiasm and dedication and passion for uh, that particular concept or a particular genre. So it's that enthusiasm that we thrive on as well. And I would also say that you don't have to speak to me directly to get a show on our air. <laughs> It's great for me to know about it, and of course I will, but I have a very talented team of people 
uh, who work for me. Likewise, every region does. So Vishnu and Cecilia and Richard and Adina, these people know our brands as well as we do. Um, and so you can speak to them and trust that they will make the right decision and get the information through to us. So don't be worried if you can't see me or anybody else on the panel. Your program will definitely get before us. Knowing your channel and knowing your audience is very important and um, high quality things for me, please. <laughs> and I, I can see that we're getting toward the end of uh, our hour and one of the things that I wanted uh, our panelists to, uh, to do is to tell us, is there something that you particularly want out of this market? Is there a program that you are looking for that you're not seeing yet? I can actually start because I, uh, I'm not seeing so much sitcoms uh, for the Russian speaking audience from, uh, for the age group, I think from 10 to 13, because it's either for the elder children or for the younger ones, but no preteens. So I'm looking for something for the preteens and I'm liking that. So if you have anything, I'll be happy to talk to you guys. <laughs> Michael? Uh, I guess um, with the rollout of Cartoonito, um, we're keeping our eye on the preschool market, but we're not ready to take on more preschool programs. Uh, we have a number of um, programs that we've launched Cartoonito with, um, including Buying Lazy Town, which we're very excited about. Um, we'll be producing a new series of Lazy Town early next year. But so preschool, we're going to wait and see how Cartoonito does, how it connects with our audiences, and then form an idea going into MIP TV about the types of preschool programs that we'll need for that channel. Boomerang, uh, we are investing in Boomerang, and we are looking for classic characters. So if you happen to have the rights to a Garfield-type show or a Pink Panther-type show, we're very interested to talk to you. And for Cartoon Network, it really is that surreal comedy um, that, that we're looking for in animation? For us, I mean, personally, we, we have an acquisition that we made last year called My Babysitter's a Vampire from our friends at Fresh TV and Fremantle. Extraordinary show, smart, funny, high production values. Um, it sits on Disney Channel. It's going to get a run on Disney XD in the very near future. I'd love to find something that's kind of a companion piece to that. Uh, that is proving very hard to find, but I'd love that. We're also, as I said, um, we're launching Fort Boyard next month, and yeah, very, very much next month. Um, and I'd love to find something in that kind of space, that reality competition for kids. That would be exciting, I think, for us. And that's, I think, on the top of the list, at least. It's pretty good wish list. So we're looking for shows for, for uh, older kids, probably 10 plus. Um, comedy works very well, but I think um, most other public channels, for example, um, CBBC or Kika in Germany, they probably um, stop with 10, 11. So and we are looking for this slightly older target group. Um, that's animation or live action um, and um, I've mentioned that we have a broad um, variety of different genres and I find it particularly hard to find documentaries or wildlife series with this special sort of edge to it. Um, Deadly 60 for example is a wonderful example of a show that works so well for us. Um, something um, in this area would be great and um, we'd be interested to find the next most amazing preschool property, whatever that is. Well, I think we've reached the end of our hour. I'd like to thank our great panel, Natalia, Michael, Karen, Barbara. Uh, I think they've given you a great idea of what, what's out there and what they're looking for. Thank you very much. And thank you all for attending, and hope you each have a good market and a successful time down here in Cannes. Thank you.